Praise the Lord. I thank God for his mighty presence here this morning. Um, as we have quickly draw, drawing close to the end of the year, I thank God that he has uh, led us all faithfully uh, through the course of the year and, uh, and been with us through uh, tough situations and good situations, and his, we could clearly see his mighty hand working in our lives. Amen. Amen? Amen. Yeah, all right. Okay, so we're going to, uh, let's read uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 3. Um, verses 5 to uh, 7. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not in, unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Praise God. Now this is a very familiar passage to us. We memorize this. We use this often uh, in our lives, and uh, we, are, you know, we put that on our, you know, on Instagram or wherever. Or, or we, uh, we, uh, we are very. This is not a strange passage to us. Is what I'm trying to say. So. Uh, Solomon here is giving us an exhortation to, uh, to un give an understanding of how we should conduct ourselves. So the issue sometimes, if you can put up my slides, please. Uh, if you can, uh, issue is not that we don't understand who God is, or issue is not that we don't understand sometimes that who is in charge and what our place is, but many times we like to well, uh, control things that are beyond our control, right? And so this passage here is reminding us that trust in God with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. And then last verse in that passage, don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Okay, so now I just want to read the definition of the word control. The power to influence or direct other people, people's behavior or the course of events. The power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. So many times we are in a position of authority, whether in church or in our families or in our work or whatever uh, aspect of your life. You might be, have given a place of authority and you have the right and the privilege to control or dictate uh, other people's uh, behaviors and things that happen in that situation, right? And you've been given that right. But control is a little bit different than position, okay? And I want to delineate the two, separate the two. Control is different than position. Whether we have the position or right or not, we all try and want to control every aspect of our lives, okay? This is not new to anybody. Everybody has this desire. So Solomon, back in Proverbs, is asking us to bring into subjection this aspect of ourselves, the desire or the need to control everything. It's easier said than done, right? Now, what did I say control was? Is the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. So, for example, maybe you are the CEO of a company, and you, what you say will dictate where the company goes, right? And you have influence over a lot of people. But many times there are people underneath the CEO who's trying to control what he does or control the situation, right? Or, or he might be controlling things he shouldn't be trying to control, he or she. So my, you see the difference is that we 
many times try to control things that are beyond our control. So let's just a, a very quick example of things that are, uh, you know, things that are course of events or nature, right? So, you know, we don't know what ha tomorrow holds. We don't know what our health is going to be like or what's going to happen in the world. We didn't, you know, when we were this time last year, we didn't know that there was a war going to break out in Israel, right? Uh, and, uh, and so that, all those things, future events are beyond our control, right? We know that and we recognize that. We don't even try to, you know, uh, do anything about that, right? So we, we uh, you know, hopefully we trust in God that whatever happens according to his plan. But my focus today, though, is to encourage you to reach that level of, you know, trust in God in the same way you view things like that. So, right, so you know you can't control what happens in Israel, you couldn't control when COVID happened or anything like that, right? So you know that and you don't even try to do anything about that. You're not spending your night and day, hopefully, trying to figure out how to change the course of the world, right? You know that's a losing battle. So my point is, if you're all with me, is to help you get to a place where you view even smaller things that you can control in that same way, right? But we try to exert where we shouldn't be, right? We are wise in our own eyes. We try to change situations. We try to change people's behavior and, and do things that twist words and go behind the back of people and try to influence things in the way we see things in our worldview, right? I'm talking about day-to-day -day life. I'm saying, let's listen to Solomon here and say, don't be wise in your own eyes. Trust in God with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, right? I'm not talking about living a passive life where you're just complacent and say, you know what, whatever happens, happens. We're just going to float through life. I am not talking about that. What did, neither is Solomon, right? What did he say? He said, in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths, right? The point is giving up control to the one who is in control, right? And allowing him to give you the direction how to do and say and conduct yourself. That make sense? You all with me today? Yes? Okay. Sometimes some response helps the speaker. You don't have to sit like a stone. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so, so that's what Solomon is saying, is on bringing that level of submission and trust in all areas of your life, right? Day-to-day -day life. Not feeling the need to control everything, right? Trusting in God to say, know when to be quiet and when to say something, right? Just like David. When he had the chance, he was in his control to kill Saul. But he knew that is not how God was going to fulfill his promise, right? Yes. And even he cut a little piece of cloth. He realized even that small action he repented of. And he said, that was not my place to do that. So those little things that you do to influence you when you know that's not your place to say something or do something, when you act out of line and you try to control other people's behavior or situation, God is saying, trust in me. Don't lean on your own understanding. But if God is telling you to speak up and do something, uh, by all means, you should have the boldness and the courage to do that, right? It has to be a balance. Understanding and all that knowledge and wisdom only comes from abiding. And that's why you'll hear that us say that all the time. Only abiding in his presence, in his secret place of prayer and meditating on his scripture will give you that direction in your life. Only abiding. Coming to church by itself doesn't do anything. Having fellowship with people doesn't do anything. Unless you abide in his presence, you will not have that ability to hand over control to God. Amen? I heard this preacher say this example once, you know, um, 
giving God control is not saying, here, God, you drive. I am, you know, going to sit next to you. But the problem is that some of us are backseat drivers. You know, you are always trying to control the person driving the car. Where to park, where to go, where to turn. You don't put your blinker on, right? Or you're always trying to control the person. So the preacher is like, no, that's not what I'm saying. You give the keys to God and you get in the trunk and say, God, take me wherever you want to take me, right? That's what giving, trusting in God is about, is about. Does that make sense? You all with me? All right. Next, uh, so I just want to give some examples, quick examples, and then I want to sh uh, spend a little time on one specific topic. Um, uh, Matthew 16. Uh, verse 21 to 23. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So uh, if you can put my slide back up. So the reason I picked this, just real quick, I forgot to mention this, the video uh, game controller is that, you know, when you play a video game, right, you're controlling the digital images on the screen, right? You're trying to move pieces around so that you can win the game, right? So that's my point in all these things, that you, you can't live your life like that, right? Trying to control everything that happens in your life, right? So if you go to the next slide, um, so who do we control? So here, Peter has been living with uh, and walking with Christ, and he's hearing all these things, and you know, he feels that he has a certain amount of influence with Christ, right? He has a relationship built up with him. So when Peter, when Jesus says something that he's going to be killed and, 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 you know, and he's going to be raised again, like Peter was like, that's going to rock my whole world. If that happens to you, what happens to me? I'm going to be without this master, right? That could be what was going I'm, I'm just, it's a conjecture on my part. He's, so immediately he said, he tried to uh, rebuke Jesus. What did he say? Don't talk like that. This is not going to happen to you. He felt, he thought he had this level of uh, privilege to be able to say that to Christ. And Christ immediately said what? Get thee behind me, Satan. You are not savoring the things of God. So, so, so Peter was trying to control Jesus. He's saying what he, the very purpose he came to the earth for that shouldn't happen to him. And he's trying to influence. This is the example I was trying to say. Many times we think it sounds good. It sounded good that Jesus should not die. He should not suffer. And his words match that. So sometimes we say things that sound good in our mind. But God is saying that was not your place to say anything. That was not your place to try to influence that situation. You should just be quiet because it's not you talking. It's the devil We're tempting you to say something you shouldn't be, right? Because Peter was trying to control Jesus. Wow, God forbid we are in that situation, right? We're trying to control what God's plan is for us. Amen? It might sound good to us, but we should be careful what we say or do, right? Uh, let's just quick example. I'm not going to read the passage. Matthew 4, the devil, he realized what God's plan is now being fulfilled. So now the devil is trying to uh, bring Jesus, uh, come to Jesus in the wilderness to tempt him, right? He tempts him three times with three different things. He is trying to control Jesus. He's trying to bring him in his power, right? And he's trying to say, if you worship me, then I'll give you all these things. We try to do this to people, right? Oh, you just do this for me, then you feel like you control somebody else. Maybe it's your husband or your wife. Maybe it's your coworker. 
you do something for them and you feel like they owe you something in return, right? You try to keep them in the palm of your hands. And when they do something you don't like, you get very angry. Wait a minute, I thought we had an understanding, right? Quid pro quo, that means what? You give something and I get something. So we try to control other people because we thought they are in your control. So the devil was trying to do this to Jesus and Jesus said what? You don't know what you're talking about, right? And he overcame the power of the devil. Amen? Amen. Uh, another quick example. Uh, in First Peter chapter 5, Peter is talking about uh, the elders or the pastors of the church. And um, verse 2 and 3. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in ensembles or examples to the flock. So he's saying, what is Peter saying? Sometimes when uh, you know, people in charge in a church or, or a committee or whatever, right, you feel like it's your God-given heritage to just force the congregation to do what you want to do. And Peter's saying, no, that's not your place, right? This is God's flock. You are a steward over them. You are supposed to shepherd them. But you are not given the authority to crush them, to bring them into your control. You all with me? Yes? Uh, the opposite is true, too. Many times the congregation wants to control the pastor and the leadership and say, oh, no, you can't do that. We dictate, decide where the church goes. And I'll come back to that in a minute, right? God is saying, no, that's not your place. You don't have the right to do that. Let God direct your path. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he'll give you wisdom what to say or do, right? I'll come back to that. I can give you other examples uh, you know, in a marriage, right? There's a God's order in the marriage. Uh, a husband being the leader of the family, and the, uh, and the wife and children all working together, right? But many times Paul, Paul says, we in submission one to another, right? So this thing that I just said works in a marriage too. It's not the husband's role to crush and dictate with an iron hand, say only my way will work in a family, right? And force your will upon, upon your family. That's not what God called us to do, amen? You have a wrong understanding if you're doing that. It is God's provision to give your wife and your children to you. You're not called to rule with an iron fist, right? The other way is true too. The wife and children should not usurp or try to control the, uh, the privilege or position that they were not given, right? You have to willingly submit yourself to the authority of your parents or your husband, right? It has to be a loving, submissive relationship with each other. And you cannot take you cannot force anybody to do anything, right? It has to be a willing submission into the role that you're given. You all with me? Everybody's so quiet today. <laughs> okay, so same thing in work, right? You might not like your boss. You might not like your coworkers. But you're called to be faithful in the place you're placed in. Not to go behind their back and gossip and try to twist people's opinion about your boss to scurry favor with other people. Right? Or to change things your way so that you can get a promotion or, or you can get a project that you want or anything like that. That is not who we're called to be. We're called to be examples, right? Whatever place we're in, so that Christ may be revealed in you. Amen? Amen? Amen. This is what living our Christian faith is, right? Is that God has to have control over your life. Yes, He will lift you up, He will exalt you when you submit to Him, right? He will direct your paths, but be careful how you conduct yourself in all these situations, right? I can give you many examples, but those are some of the things that came to mind. Um, so I wanted to focus in on a specific topic uh, about the church itself, uh, but I want to uh, discuss a story from 2 Samuel, and I believe I've spoken about this a long time ago here. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, if you can go to the next slide, please. So, 
um, I'm going to quickly give the background of this story. Um, and it actually starts in 1 Samuel chapter 4. And when, uh, when is, uh, Israel uh, was under Saul and they, the Philistines came and attacked them and captured uh, the ark of God and took it back to Philistine, right? And kept it there in their temple and lots of stuff happened to them. Their idols fell down and they were afraid and they put the ark on a cart and just let it go and it landed in the house of an Israelite and it, it, well, his name was Abinadab, right? And it came to Israel and that is in 1 Samuel chapter 6. You can read all that. And many, many years passed by and now fast forward you're in the time of David. He is now king, and he, he's like, you know what? Yeah, so when, in fact, when the ark left, right, uh, I can't remember if it was Hophni or Phinehas, it was Phinehas's wife, she died in pregnant childbirth and named her son Ichabod, meaning what? The glory has departed Israel, right? So because it, the ark was gone, so the glory of God had departed Israel at that time. So and now the ark has come back and sitting in Abinadab's house for a long time. And they have, you know, the families conducting themselves. That many years have passed. And now David remembered the ark. And he said, I'm going to go get the ark and bring it back to Jerusalem, right? And so he, uh, he chose uh, men of Israel, 30,000 people, to go with them. It's a big contingent now going to go to Abinadab's house and bring the ark back, okay? So, so what happened there is they came to uh, Abinadab's house, which was in a place called Gibeah, um, and he had two, uh, two sons. One was Uzzah, and the other was Ahio, right? Uzzah and Ahio. And so what they decided to do was, the, so the ark came to their house in a cart, driven by oxen, right? That's how the Philistines sent it. They were afraid. They didn't know what to do. Let's see where it goes. And the oxen brought the cart with the ark to Abinadab's house, and it's been staying there for a long time. And so when David came there, and they were bringing the ark now back uh, with him, they decided, you know what? Let's make a new cart, Right? And they made a new cart and put two oxen. Now Abinadab's two sons were driving the ox cart. You all with me? So the two sons were Uzzah and Ahio. Now they were driving the ox cart to take back to Jerusalem. And, um, and, uh, and you can see there's a great procession. I said 30,000 people and there's all kinds of music. And, uh, you know, it says uh, instruments made of uh, verse 5 of Second Samuel 6. Firwood, harps, and psaltery, timbrel, cymbals, all these things. There was great sound of what looks like worship and praise happening in this place as the ark is coming back. And suddenly, the ox, we know the story, right? One of the ox went out of the way and looked like the whole thing was going to fall, fall over. And Uzzah got scared, and he's like, oh, I can't let that happen. So he tried to prop it up, the ark. And what happened to Uzzah at that time? He died. God immediately, his anger went out and struck him, and he immediately died. So now David, who's watching all of this, he, real, he was so afraid. Um. And he just put, brought the ark back to the house of a place, person called Obed at home. And the ark lived there because he's like, I don't, I'm not going to do anything with this. I don't know what to do. I feel that I don't know God right now is what his feeling was. He's like, I don't know why this just happened. Right? And then after a while, it dawned on him why. And this time... He came back and did it the right way. Okay? So now what is the mistake that David did the first time? Why did Uzzah die? See, the reason Uzzah died 
It looked like the right thing to do. He was trying to control the situation. He was trying to stop the ark from falling over and a disaster happening, right? But the problem is the ark was not supposed to be carried by oxen, transported by oxen. Abinadab and Ahio, sorry, Uzzah and Ahio had no place to drive the cart. They were, that was not their role. That was not, they were not allowed to do that, to take the cart back. That was not their job. So sometimes we think that it's our role to step up and do something oh, oh, because that we feel like there's a power vacuum. We feel like, you know, we need to dictate how things go. And Abinadab, sorry, Uzzah and Ahio stepped up and drove the ox cart, right? Against the ordinance of God. How was the ark supposed to be carried? On the shoulders of priests, right? And they go uh, uh, as directed by God, right? In the Old Testament, you can see they stopped and went as, as uh, when the, cloud, the pillar of cloud stopped, they stopped. When it went, they went, right? It was supposed to be carried on the shoulders of anointed men of God. But what they did there was against the ordinance of God. They put it on a cart, a new cart, but still just a cart, driven by oxen, controlled by two men that were not in charge. You all with me? So when David saw that, he was afraid. But then he realized what went wrong, and he corrected the situation. So this, I said all this to compare to our church. People who should not be controlling and driving the church is are who control and drive the church. People, that's why many people are spiritually dead because there are Uzzahs trying to fix the situation, but it's not being run the right way in the first place, right? We have to realize that church is supposed to be run and governed by anointed men of God. God called to be in those positions. So when, when you feel like you have to step up, you have to ask God to direct your ways. Say, this is what you want me to do. The opposite is true too. If God is leading you to step up and take up roles and you know, leadership in the church, don't run away from his voice. Don't be like Moses who was afraid because he said, I am a stutterer. God was angry at him, right? Don't run away, but neither take up things that you're not called to do. And overstep the provision and the ordinance of God. I hope I'm being clear. It's, so, I, you know, uh, I don't know why God put this thought in my heart, but this topic in my heart. But as, as we're going through you know, process of selecting people for the next couple of years. All of these things have to be in your mind. Like, am I, what does God want me to do? You know, just because we don't like how the church is going, we're not called to just control things. You don't, you, we're not called to just do or say things that we shouldn't be saying or doing. We shouldn't be having conversations with people trying to influence other people and directing. That's how, that's how th things go out of line right? But if we submit ourselves to God, I want to serve you and I want to step up. God will give you the anointing to do that, right? But not think that it is our God-given right to dictate what the church should do, what the pastor should do, or who should be the pastor or anything like that. It is not our God-given right. We are to trust in God at all times. Ask him and the worship team, please come forward. Uh, ask him to direct our paths. Ask him to give us the anointing to, to serve in his kingdom. It is so important to do this. And when people, so that's why Solomon said what? In all thy ways, um, let me read that real quick. Uh, Proverbs 3, 7. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. David got that fear of God. At first, he tried to control the situation. Then he 
got that fear of God in his heart and said, no, I'm not in control. I'm going to obey God. Amen? That's where we should come back to is ask God. Don't be wise in our own eyes. Fear God and he will direct our paths. Amen? Does that make sense? So let's read. I'm going to read one more passage and I'll conclude. First uh, Peter chapter 5. Verse 4, and when the chief shepherd uh, shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. This is our ultimate hope, that our chief shepherd will come one day, and he, we will receive a crown of glory. We're only called to be faithful and stewards of what God has given us, right? And be faithful and trustworthy to live out the calling and in all the places, whether it's at work or at home or in church, live out the calling that he has given us and, and push forth through those situations. And know that God, Jesus, who is the chief shepherd, when he comes, he will give us a crown of glory that never fades away, that will never be taken away from us. He will satisfy our craving for power and control. He will fill that void in our, in our broken selves or broken by sin. He will fill that void now through the Spirit, but also bring it to completion at His coming with the crown of glory. That will never fade away. Nobody will take our position away from us, but Christ is faithful to give it to us. But he, what He's looking for us, from us in return is faithfulness. To stay the course and not try to be like Abraham, not wait for the promise of God, had to try to control the situation by being with Hagar. If he had waited for Isaac, everything would have come to pass in his time, right? So let us know and trust in God, be faithful in the places he has placed us, so that he might receive the ultimate glory. May his name be glorified.